Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Why don't rise up with us and we will run through a couple of songs and just lift up the name of Jesus this morning. Glad to see you. It's an amazing day. And we're going to have an amazing morning. All right, here we go. I'm not going to wait. Wait for the walls to fall. Because I know a name that can bring them down. This morning, I got a praise. It's waking within my soul. And I'm not ashamed to declare it now. Let's go. Light up the world. Trample the dark. great song to kick off our morning with. That's so wonderful. Listen, I'm so glad that you've joined us, whether you're here in the room or watching online. We're so thankful you've joined us. You can go ahead and grab a seat. Actually, if you're at home, you can even grab a seat too. Like, feel free. Um, that's a joke because you probably are seating. But anyway, it's good. Uh, today we're concluding our series called The Story of the Bible. And during this series, we have actually had a Bible trivia contest. And I don't know about you, this is meant to be fun. So before I even dive into it, here's what I want you to do. If you're like, I'm going to know the answer, then you can work alone. 
But if you're like, I might not know the answer, huddle up with somebody else. You can, if you're at home watching, like pull out another screen, open up Google, like be ready for this because we want to encourage everybody to participate. Uh, it's super fun. So what we've been doing, we're going to ask you three questions. You're going to see a phone number come up on the screen. And what you want to do is even now, pull out your phone and begin a text to that number. Um, yeah, it's right there. Um, I'm not going to tell you that that's my number, but it technically is. So um, you're going to text that number, and everybody who gets it right is going to have a chance to win a Tim Hortons gift card. So I know what you're thinking. What are the questions? Well, let me tell you. Uh, so the first question is this. You ready? Have you started a text? Okay, Miranda has. Good. All right, so the first question is, who baptized Jesus in the Jordan River? Who baptized Jesus in the Jordan River? Like, who was the baptizer? Who was the maybe Baptist that baptized Jesus in the river? Who could that be? Uh, question number two, what three words did Jesus say before he died? Now, there's, some, there's lack of clarity in this question. We don't mean any three words that he said before he died. Like, technically, like, lots of the Bible is words he said before he died. But we're looking for the last phrase before uh, he died. Um, and then, you didn't laugh at that one. That's okay. Uh, question number three is, what does James say we should do if we need wisdom? What what does James say we should do if we need wisdom? And so we'll announce the winner later in our experience today, but uh, go ahead and text them in. My watch is buzzing like crazy, so people are already starting, so that's just perfect. I'll take a look at those, uh, and we'll come back. Now, here at Gateway, we are a community that is all about encouraging each other to take a step in the right direction. And so the first thing, if you're new here with us, we want to encourage you to have a great experience today. We spend a lot of time preparing the experience, trying to make sure that you have a good time, that this is a good experience for you, a positive experience. And then after you have your good experience, maybe you've been here for a little while, you can actually move and take a step forward to, to begin to find a place to belong. And today is a great day for that because we actually have a number of opportunities and ministries and things in the atrium if you're here in person. Person, that you can check out and see a little bit of how you can join maybe a connect group, whether you can serve or become a part of what we do here. And then the last thing is as we go through the steps, you're, we're going to invite you to join us to care for others. And so you might be here and you're like, whoa, first day, you know, that's a lot to ask of me. That's okay. We're not asking you. We're asking you to just continue along and at whatever step you're at, you know, maybe you've been here for a little while and it might be time to begin exploring a connect group or maybe, you know, you've been here, you've been in connect groups. Maybe it's time to look at opportunities to join and serve. That's wherever you are, we want to encourage you to take a step. If you are here and you're newer with us, you know, we're so glad you are here and we would love to connect with you and to help you. On screen, you're going to see a QR code. We'd love to invite you to fill out a connect card so we can get to know you a little bit. If you're here in person, you can actually stop by the welcome desk outside in the atrium before you leave, all right? I don't know about you, but I thought the worship team did a great job on that first song, and I would love to hear them do some more. So uh, I'm going to invite you to stand. Yes, even you at home, I'm going to invite you to stand and join us as the team leads us in some more songs.
take a moment just right now to pray for our missionaries. Pray for the missionaries around the world, the people we've talked about who have experienced what it means to experience, to belong, and then have chosen to care for those around the world. And so we want to pray for missionaries everywhere, but especially the ones that we support. We've got Kathy and Kathy Meisen and Alvin and Nellie Anderson in Honduras. We've got the Hutchinsons in Southeast Asia, Phil Ott in Calgary, and the DeWitts in France, as well as we're part of a fellowship that has missionaries around the world. We want to pray for them. So won't you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, We declare that you are great. Just as we've been singing about, about how great you are, God, I pray that as these people have given their lives to spread your love, your life, and your hope, I pray right now, God, that you would surround them. For those who are in difficult circumstances, I pray they would be encouraged, God. For those who are in challenging environments, we think of missionaries in Russia and Ukraine, and, and as all of that, is happening, God. We pray that they would know your peace, that they would know your presence, that they would know the calling that you have placed on them. We think of those we've had opportunity to meet, like Kathy and Alvin and Nelly and, uh, and from Honduras and the great work you're doing there, God. We pray you would bless them for the Hutchinsons, for Pastor Phil Odd in Calgary and for the DeWitts who've been here many times, God. We just pray right now that doors would be open as the world begins to open up, God, I pray that they would have new opportunities to share your light in this dark world. We believe that you are the hope of this world. And I thank you, God, that there are people who have given their lives for that exact purpose, to share that light. And we pray that you would bless them today, God. Be with them in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for singing with us. I'm gonna invite you to grab a seat. I was not necessarily prepared for the number of texts that came in today. Which I don't know what I was expecting, but I wasn't expecting this many. So I'll announce the winner in a second, but first we must review the answers. So the first question, I tried to give you a bit of a hint here. The first question was, who baptized Jesus in the Jordan River? The answer is, of course, John the Baptist. Pastor Blair thinks it's Mary because he needed a bath, but no, the answer we're looking for is John the Baptist. Uh, and what three words did Jesus say before he died? Again, it's slightly confusing because there's a number of his last sayings, but the answer we're looking for is, it is finished. And then what does James say we should do if we need wisdom? He says, ask Siri. No, I'm kidding. He says, ask God for it um, because God gives wisdom to those who seek him. So we do have a winner. That's the only reason I have my phone here. And his name is Jim Williams. And so Jim, congratulations. Uh, thanks so much for playing. He's watching online today, so we're gonna get that sent out to him and uh, he'll be able to enjoy all of that. Uh, I'm so excited to talk to you about our next two things today. We have some great things coming up here at Gateway Church. And the first is next Sunday. Next Sunday, we have a unique experience, something a little bit different called Our Heart for Our House. And basically, we're going to be focusing on what it means to be together, belonging, and unity together. You're going to have opportunity. This is going to blow your mind coming out of COVID, but you're going to have opportunities to interact with each other. You're gonna be like, I can interact with you. Of course, masks, all that, we're still doing that, but you'll at least be able to interact, which we're really, really excited about. We're gonna have communion together and lots of fun features, including different seating. That's right, the chairs are gonna be different next week. Uh, I'm like, does that mean new chairs? No, no, it doesn't mean new chairs. It means chairs arranged differently. For those of you watching online, of course, you'll still be able to tune in and there'll be lots of elements for you to engage with as well. But this may be an opportunity where you say, hey, maybe I will you know, venture out. We'd love to see you, um, of course. And then the other thing that's got me really, really excited comes up later in the month, March 25th to 27th is our Pursuit Conference. And I don't know if you've been to the Pursuit Conference, but it is an amazing opportunity. Basically, we have Friday evening, Saturday evening, and Sunday morning services that, uh, where we as a group collectively pursue God. It's, I mean, great, Gateway Sunday morning experiences are fantastic, but this is honestly, uh, 
it sounds bad to say it like this, but it's a next level. Like these are opportunities that you do not want to miss. For those of you watching online, only this Sunday morning will be available. The Friday evening and Saturday evening won't be live streamed, so you may want to join us. We have special guests all the way from really far away. We have Al and Esther Derry. I believe they're in Alberta. Is that correct? No, BC, so it's as far away in Canada as you can get. Um, but the, the conference is free, you just have to register for it and you'll see there's a QR code and you can visit our website to do that. Um, I promise you this is something you do not want to miss. I remember hearing Al Derry when I was like 16. So he's been around a long time and he was really good then, so he's gonna be really good now. Anyway, uh, that, that didn't come out the way I wanted it to. That's okay. <laughs> It's all good. Uh, we want to thank you as well for your generosity and for your giving. This supports the ministries. It supports the missionaries we were praying for. It helps us fulfill our mission. And of course, you can see ways to give on screen. Um, we have new ways you can give here in the building, things like Apple Pay and Google Pay, credit cards, debit, all that can be done out in the atrium. Um, but even that, I just want to encourage you, helps us fulfill the mission we believe we have. And one of the things we do in order to do that is we make lunches for sanctuary London to, to hand out. And so every Sunday there's a team that just prepare sandwiches and prepare lunches and they get handed out here in our city, downtown London. So you may want to consider like as you're giving, hey, maybe throw a few extra bucks to help support that. Or when you give, it's, it's part of supporting the mission of what we do here. And so lastly, we have an amazing kids and student program here at Gateway Church. And we, as a parent, I'm so blessed by what is made available to, our, to my daughter and our students. And so I just want to encourage you, if you're watching online or here in person, you know, there are online experiences for them, of course. You can visit our website, the QR code on screen. If you are here in person, you are a middle school student, that's grades six to eight, your, uh, your experience is going to begin now. So you can head out to the atrium where you'll meet your teacher. Um, and for those of you not here in the building, you can, of course, go to the website, watch the video that is prepared just for you. Now, just before Pastor Blair comes to speak, I'd like to invite those of you who are not in grade six to eight to have a moment of discussion with those around you. So I'm going to give you a question. You're going to have a couple minutes to talk about it um, and share just openly, honestly with the person you came with. Um, and if you're watching at home alone, then you can just maybe ponder it or text a friend and say, hey, what do you think about this? Um, so here's your question. How do you think we should view the Old and the New Testaments differently? And what is Christianity based on? So we'll give you a couple of minutes to talk through that. The question will appear on the screen and uh, we'll be right back.
the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B I B L E. The B I B L E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word. Hey, Bob, what are you doing? Uh, nothing. Just cleaning up a little. Well, good morning again. It's so good to be here getting to speak to you. This past week, I was able to speak to our high school students, the junior high school students together. Boy, was that a lot of fun. You know what? I was actually a little bit nervous. I I was nervous uh, because those students are so moldable and there's still such a a wonder and awe about them, about how they see the world and the Bible that it just feels like... Like, like responsible, you know what I mean? It's, it's, so, it's so big, it kind of made me nervous, but it, it was a lot of fun together. And I can remember actually being more nervous at one time about adults than I was kids, but I realized something changed that I used to say that back then when I made that transition. But when, when teenagers look at you, across the rise, it just says, please don't bore me. Like whatever you do up there, please don't bore me. And adults actually have a different look across your eyes, and maybe you could find that in the the eyes of the person you're sitting next to. But whatever it says, I think it says from this point is like, please don't waste my time. And you're like, ah, all right, so both have their unique challenges. Uh, but this week I found that teenagers are a little more challenging than adults because of how moldable they are. And the older we get, the more stuck in the, our ways we get. Like I admit that. Yeah, I could get very stubborn, very stubborn. And so it's hard to adjust. It's hard to adjust, but I'm appreciated for our time here today and that you let me speak in your life. And I hope I give you something to think about and pray about and ponder uh, for at least the afternoon. Today we're wrapping up our series called The Story of the Bible. And we did this series for many reasons. Many really good, important reasons. But one of them is because it's so easy to doubt the Bible. It's so easy from afar to poke fun at the Bible and find missing holes. It's so easy to randomly grab uh, a scripture from the Old Testament in one translation and compare it to another uh, verse in the New Testament, a different translation, and go, See, the Bible doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. You could easily go onto YouTube and find people that make fun of the Bible all the time. And from a far ways, they're like, come on, this doesn't make sense. This is ridiculous. So we wanted to do this series because we wanted to raise some of those questions to really understand how we got the Bible and why we got the Bible actually takes some work. It takes some further study. It takes some more investigation. And I'm so encouraged that many of you responded to our poll this week. Many of you responded responded with, is the Bible so relevant to your life? 97% said yes, or at least of those who have responded. So we're really encouraged by that. But honestly, it's so great when we are running into a coworker that might not have that same emotional connection that you might have to the Bible. Like you've, perhaps you're here today, you got your Bible a long time ago and you've applied these things to your life and you've found it impact you emotionally, spiritually, and physically to you're saying, I testify that this is, this is life, but not everybody else is there. And so they're asking you, why do you go to church? Why do you read that Bible? And let me tell you, they need a better answer then. Well, it's true because the Bible says so. The Bible says it's true, so the Bible says it's true. So the Bible, you see what I'm saying? Like our kids and our family members and our neighbors need better answers than the Bible says it's true, so it is true. 
right? You're tracking with that today? So this is why we wanted to do the story of the Bible, to give us more understanding about the backstory of the Bible because it sheds light on the story together. Many of us know that some of the Bible stories, but didn't know how the story got put together and how the Bible became the Bible in itself. I can remember getting this Bible uh, towards the end of high school, and I was like, oh, shoot, I thought I actually got this Bible, this copy of the Bible uh, at the beginning of high school. Uh, but I, that one was well worked over with youth and crusader, crusaders, if you remember that, you know, admission strips and youth camps and it got beat up, and I bet you there was a signature of Tim Schwint and the calling in that first copy in there, and it was just like, oh, I wish I still had that. My parents, my parents gave me this one when I said I was going to go to Bible college, and I, and I think that's because they wanted like a heavy preacher, you know, like just like somebody that would smack them. No, that's not how it was, but so that I could actually dig into it and study it together. Because when I got my Bible and all the way Bibles, right, it was chaptered and versed and it was put together and perhaps sold in stores, right? And that's the challenge for us because how you got your Bible is not how everyone got their Bible, right? For us, you could just go to a store and buy it, but that's not how it is. We didn't find our Bible in the ground or in a cave, or a man didn't go into a cave and see a vision from an angel and wrote everything down, and then a thousand years passed by, and that's the copy. That's not how we got our Bible. So it's really important we figure out how it all kind of came together. So we've discussed for a few weeks now that the Bible, the beginning of the story of the Bible doesn't actually start in Genesis. But many of us who try to start reading the Bible, we start in Genesis. But you're like, no, that's not how actually the story started. The story started when? If you've been tracking with this, when? Easter Sunday. Because when Jesus died and rose again, they were like, oh my goodness, his life is really special. His words are unbelievably unique. We need to write down everything that he said. And the more they wrote down and documented everything that he said, they became fascinated about all of the, the scriptures and the words that were said in the law and the prophets. We call it the Old Testament, talked about Jesus coming. You're like, when Jesus died and rose again, you're like, this changes everything everything. But if he didn't rise from the dead, if there had been no resurrection, there would be no Bible because the story of Jesus would not have been worth telling. It'd be like all the other books out there. And you're like, well, that's a nice story. That's really good. That might be inspirational, but it doesn't change everything like the resurrection does. We believe that the Bible happened. The Bible was put together because of the resurrection of Jesus. So we've got as we've talked in this series, we've, we've got the story of Jesus, we've got his backstory, but there's a huge section towards the end of the New Testament that we want to talk about today, and that's all of the different letters that Paul the Apostle wrote. Paul the Apostle wrote to him, we bring our attention this morning. So the Apostle Paul, what he was, he had two, actually two names. He had a name called Saul of Tarsus and Paul, but why does he have two names? Well, when he was working as a Hebrew Pharisee, his name was Saul of Tarsus, and when he he changed his profession, changed his calling to a Roman church planner, he better go with his Roman name. So that's how it switches over to Paul. And it's not an exaggeration to say that Paul was one of the most influential leaders of the early church. In fact, some might say if Paul didn't do what he did, we might not even have a church here, but God would work in different ways. But Paul was that kind of key guy. Some people would even say that if he took what the, all of the other disciples did and compared it to Paul, Paul might have even did all of them combined kind of difference here. Paul was a very significant person. And when he wrote these letters to the churches that he was speaking to and planting all over the place, those letters that lasted through history have actually changed the way our Western civilization is today. They would say that we are having a Western culture because of the things that Paul wrote. So Paul is a really big deal, a super big deal. But if he was here with us today, we're like, Paul, we can't believe you're here. This is fantastic. He would say, no, no. He would say, no, you shouldn't honor me this way at all. And we're like, Paul, you wrote so much of the New Testament. Paul, you planted so many churches. You said so many things that were so important. You should get some of the credit. We should like be super thankful for you. And he's like, it's not the way I view myself. That's not the way I view myself. You see, in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he says, I'm the least of the apostles 
and do not even desire to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He's like, please don't put me on a big pedestal because that's not how my life actually journeyed started. He started off as a Pharisee and a Pharisee would study the Old Testament and memorize that he was the Pharisee of Pharisees. And as he understood all that would have happened in, in the Old Testament, what he did is he approached, he went to Jerusalem and he spoke to the high priest and he got permission to shut down the believers of Jesus at that time, to shut the them down in any way possible that he could. He got permission to go ahead and arrest them, to find out and torture them if need be, to stop them from believing. In fact, even put them to death. So Paul carried this everywhere he went. He's like, this is how I started my life. This is how, this is what I was famous with. I got to carry that kind of guilt around. You see, he really believed that these, this group of people were trying to change all of the Hebrew history. They were like, why are you following such a criminal that he had to die on a cross, like to be crucified? Like that's a criminal of criminal's death, that this must be shut down so it doesn't grow. So he hunted them down, hunted them down wherever he could. And would you believe it? For an amazing series of events that we'll talk about at a different time, God chose Paul to be his leader, to become the person that would take the message of Jesus to the entire known Gentile world, which is the Gentile world is everywhere but Israel. That God would chose Paul to change his life around to become the most influential person. So there's a huge change that's happening here, which just speaks to the rest of us, doesn't it? That no matter where we've gone or what we've done in the past or where we consider ourselves, God can use anyone if he can use Paul. It testifies to us. So Paul was a big deal and he did a lot of great things for the earlier church, early church and he does extraordinary things to the story of Bible and I'm gonna give you three of those reasons here today. I'm gonna give you three reasons why Paul was so influential to the story of the Bible. The first one is kind of quick, which I've already kind of touched on a little bit, that Paul wrote 13 books of the New Testament. Paul wrote the 13 books of the New Testament, but books, not really books, more like letters. And when he wrote them, he felt like he was writing to his friends, to Timothy and to Titus. And he's like, oh, I went over to this church and I want to send them more encouragement. So I got out a letter and I sent them a letter and I, and I went over, I was like, oh, there's a bunch of churches in Rome and they need some encouragement. They need some teaching. They haven't traveled that much. So I'm going I'm to write them a letter and we'll call it the book of Romans. And when he was writing these things, you have to know that he wasn't thinking about writing a Bible. He wasn't thinking about writing a book. He was just writing to his friends. But Paul's letters were so valuable, so helpful, so unifying, so encouraging that Christians would share it with each other. They're like, you won't believe what Paul's letter wrote that we heard today. You got to get, you don't have a copy. Let me write down my copy. And they might have gotten out of bed. It's like, before you leave today, this is so important. And they shared it and they copied it and shared it and they copied it so that everybody could have these precious words, precious encouraging words for the church. And over time, they were considered sacred scripture. So Paul wrote 13 books or 13 letters of the New Testament to his friends. And the second reason why Paul seems to be such a big deal of the story of the church, Paul explains the relationship between the Old and the New Testament. He explains the relationship between the two of them. And you've already started discussing that. What is the relationship between the two of them? So if you've ever been confused about something that the Old Testament says and the New Testament says and somebody else says, oh, isn't God the same yesterday and today and forever? So how come it seems like two different God's almost in the, in, the, in the Old Testament and New Testament. Well, Paul is absolutely your guy. And the reason why Paul is your guy is because he was an expert at the Old Testament. This is what he went to school for. This is what he spoke on. He, teach, he knew it almost better than anyone else. I'm sure that he would argue. And so when he writes these letters, he's showing you this comparison and putting them together. But if you happen to be there, if he happened to actually, sorry, be there when your parents or somebody, a Gideon, or maybe uh, somebody passed you a copy of the Bible to you, Paul would go, now let me give you some instructions. Can I give you a couple of tips? Can I, can I encourage you a little bit? I think he would say two things. The first thing he would say is read the Old Testament for inspiration and motivation. Read the Old Testament 
for inspiration and motivation. You see, you have to understand this and remind ourselves, and this be, hit, hopefully hits you afresh today. You need to know that the word testament is Latin for the Greek word covenant. And the covenant is an arrangement or even, even a, a lighter term is a contract. The entire Jewish Bible, the Old Testament is organized around an arrangement between God and ancient Israel. This is an agreement between two people. I'll do this, you do that. I'll do this and you do that. So all of the stories in the Old Testament reflect this agreement, all of them. And all of the prophets that prophesied and said things in the Old Testament were underneath that contract, all that uh, contract. But with the coming of Jesus, the arrangement was replaced with a new one, a brand new one, an even better new one, we would say, a brand new contract and a brand new covenant that you are a part of. And this new covenant comes with better promises. Let me illustrate this for you. You sell your house and you move to a new house. Do you go back to the old mortgage and reread the rules? No, that's the old house. You don't live there anymore. You don't leave, so you, you don't go, oh, gee, you could go back for, hey, this was fascinating, remember this? Do you remember how much we paid? Oh man, that was crazy when houses were cheaper back then and, and the interest rates were so different. That you go back for inspiration and motivation, not for application to which we're about to get into. See, Paul makes this clear in 1 Corinthians 10, and so I'd like you to take some time maybe this week to go back to 1 Corinthians 10 and reread it because Paul is talking about what was going on with the Exodus people, and he says these very words. He says, this is an example to us. This is an example to us. This is an illustration to us. So don't get focused on the little details of it. Go for inspiration and motivation because God's people struggled and God came through. And he's been faithful through it. That's what you're like. It's like God's people cried out for God to move in their lives and he was faithful and he came and he responded. So when you remember that when you're reading the Old Testament, it's just a backstory to the coming of Jesus that talked about an old arrangement, but today you have a new one replaced with a new one with better promises. That's how you should read the Old Testament. Well, Paul, what should we do with the New Testament? Well, take your application cues from Jesus' new commandment. That's what he would say from the New Testament. Listen, take your application cues of Jesus' new commandment for your life. So when you're like, how should I live? How should I have relationship with those around me? How should I be a dad? How should I be a father? How should I be a worker? How should I be a neighbor? How should I do these things? Paul says, let's go look at Jesus' new command of living. So Jesus, at the end of his ministry, he was spending some time at his last Passover meal with his disciples. And he said to them, a new command I'm giving you. And it's not a command that I'm adding on top of the other ones. I'm not adding upon, adding upon, adding. No, this is the command. This is the preeminent command. This is the dominant command. This is the ultimate ethic. This is the guiding light for all of your Christian behavior. This is the big one that you need to worry about and consider yourself thinking about every single day. He said, guys, there's a new command. As I have loved you, you are to love one another. As I have loved you, you are to love one another. Don't love as others have loved you and don't love as you want to be loved. That's the golden rule. This is a golden rule from the Sermon on the Mount that he started his ministry with in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Jesus says, love as you want to be, love as you want to be treated by other people. And now at the end of his ministry, he's saying, I've got a better one, a bigger one. This is what you should do. Love, you should love as I have loved you. As God the Father has loved you through me. And then he demonstrated that love by dying on the cross for us. And so when Paul's writing his letters, and he's, they are, he's writing them with application of Jesus' new command in mind, when Paul says in the rest of his letters, don't do this and do this and don't do that and do this, and he's kind of working his way, it's only application to that one simple command. Let me give you an illustration of that. Philippians 2.5 says, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who took on the form of a servant. 
He said, this is how Jesus lived. He served everybody everywhere he went. He didn't put the guard card down. He didn't say, I'm better than you. He acted like he wasn't better than anybody. And he served and he served, he served. He's like, I'm gonna put you first and me last. This is how we live. And he says, this is how you should love everyone that you meet, everyone that you're an eyeball with, the people that you live with, the people that you work with, the people you live next to. Don't love them as they are loving you. Love them as I have loved you. And we serve them. Another verse is this, Ephesians 4, Paul says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And you're like, forgive them? Paul, you don't understand what they did to me. You don't understand what kind of person is. You don't want me to forgive them. And they're like, no, 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 that, what you're talking about there is the golden rule. We've got a better rule for you now. It's not the golden rule, it's better than that. It's the platinum rule. The platinum rule was for you. Forgive them because I have forgiven you. Not because they deserve it, but because I've shown you. I've shown you because Jesus deserves it. We forgive. If Paul had been there when we got our first Bible, he would say there's this relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament. You have to view them differently. You have to look at the Old Testament for inspiration and motivation but take your application cues from Jesus' new command. The last point is this, and I hope I'm trying to squeeze in to make sure I have enough time for all of us today because it might be the most important part of this last message, if not the whole series. Paul, why does he contribute to the Bible so much and why is it so important? Because Paul authenticates the most important event recorded in it, and that's the resurrection of Jesus. Paul authenticates the resurrection of Jesus. Because maybe you heard this. Maybe you've been questioned this. Maybe you read a book and somebody said this. Maybe you went to university or college and a teacher said this. And you're like, actually, I don't think Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John actually wrote those gospels. I don't think they actually wrote it in the timeline that you're suggesting. This was what people would say. They was like, I actually think that the Christian community, kind of years later after the eyewitnesses died, years later put these stories together that way that would make sense. And he put it in, and then over time, the story turned into like, kind of like a fairy tale about Jesus rising from the dead and maybe rising from the dead. He's like, he's living through all of us and his ideals. And that's how he's actually rising from the dead. And so the Christian community over time adopted the idea of the resurrection of Jesus. But something that we read from 1 Corinthians 15 puts all of that away. 1 Corinthians 15, and I encourage you, we're gonna read it in a minute, but you wanna read it and reread it all over again. So if you have your Bible with you here today, I encourage you, 1 Corinthians 15, let's look it up here together. Because what Paul says in this letter completely uh, disputes that as, as, uh, as proof at all. He says the Jewish community immediately accepted the idea of Jesus' resurrection. And to help prove that, I'm gonna show a little bit of a timeline here that you might put, your, put on the screen for me. See, here's the deal. To make this case, we're gonna timeline. It's a little bit like school and you're gonna memorize this and know it forever and it's gonna be great. See, no one disputes both uh, Christians and secular uh, historical uh, people don't dispute at all that uh, Paul the apostle lived and no one disputes that he wrote this document we call 1 Corinthians. No one, Christian or not, they believe it happened. And he wrote this in the year 55. And he's speaking in 55 about his trip to plant this church three years prior to that in the year 52. In the year 52, he planted this church in Corinthians. And as he speaks, he's talking about what he learned from the disciples themselves in the year 49 and 40. Paul spent time with the disciples who were actually eyewitnesses to the accounts of Jesus, spoke to them personally in the years 49 and 40. And three years prior to that, he became a follower of Jesus. And some people actually say that he became a Christian in, th in, in 33. So between 33 and 35, he starts to follow Jesus. And we understand that just shy of those years, Jesus actually died and rose again. So you can see what you're putting together here and you're smart people, you put it together. It simply is this. If the Christian community fabricated the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, then how in the world did Paul know about it so early? He's writing this document at 55 from a church that he planted at 52 to which he was preaching from what he learned from 49 and 40 because of he experienced with Jesus in 37 because Jesus died and rose again around 33. 
This disputes and this puts the idea is that the Christian church immediately, not later on, but immediately believed that Jesus died and rose again and made an impact on their life. As we read in 1 Corinthians 15, I remind you of the gospel that I preached to you. For what I received, I pass on to you as first importance. So good. That he's not making this up. Somebody told me and I was face to face with them. They were there and I'm passing it on to you that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he said, Jesus appeared to Peter and the rest of the 12 and to hundreds of people saying, fact check me, prove me wrong, get in a boat with me, let's go to Jerusalem now and still talk to the hundreds of people that saw Jesus alive so that you can believe what I believe today, that Jesus died and rose again. Now those, those two verses right in the middle there, verse three and four, some people say that Paul has actually been quoting a creed, a creed that was already written. See what the Christian church would do, because a lot of people didn't read, and a lot of people even if they did read, they didn't have books, because it was expensive to get books. So they would handcraft these statements, these crucial statements, perfectly word them, so that you could memorize them and pass them down from generation to generation to generation, so that no information was lost. A lot of people believe that Paul is quoting here a creed that was already in place. And if he wrote it down in 55, it was already in place of something of so importance, of such importance. He says this, Christ died for our sins and was buried. And he rose again. He rose from the dead and was seen. Christ died for our sins and was buried. He rose from the dead and was seen. It has a rhythm to it so that you could say it over and over again. Christ died for our sins and was buried. And he rose from the dead and was seen. And this became the moment, the event that started a movement that caused people to write down these documents and collect these documents and put them together that would eventually become the Bible eventually become the Bible. It's amazing that by the end of the fourth century, the very organization, the very institution that, that crucified Jesus ended up relieving the, the penalty of having other, lifted the ban on other religions and so that people could openly work on these documents and put them together. In fact, the, the Roman Empire paid for the works of the Bible to come together, to come together. And this book would eventually shape Western civilization that would eventually shape my life and maybe would shape yours here today. But here's the part that we want you to end with and really grasp here over this series. The Bible did not create Christianity. The Christian faith is, is the result of an event that created a movement that produced texts that were collected and protected and bound into a book. Christianity is the result of the resurrection. If there was no resurrection, Jesus' story would have never been told. And it's important that it was told because Christ died for our sins and was buried. And he was raised from the dead and he was seen. So as you reflect, as you move forward, the big question of the Bible isn't, are you at peace with everything in the Bible? That's not the most important question to ask. The most important question is, are you at peace with the God who sent his son into the world to die and pay for our sins so that you could have what Jesus promised, a relationship with your father in heaven? That's the point of the Bible. And that's the story we pass on and I encourage you to read and to read and to read. So we've had a few responses throughout this series that we'll give you one last reminder of because we'd love you to dive in and let it shape your life. The first one is that we have four different Bible reading plans that we've talked about. We encourage you to check those out. You can find that online and on the screen as well here today. But if any of the questions about something I've said or any of the messages in this series, we'd love to hear from you. We'll be open with it. Let's grab a coffee and sit and chat with it. And if you don't have a physical Bible, you've never been given a physical Bible, we would love 
love to give you your first Bible here today, this morning. You can see the reception area afterwards. And on March the 9th, we're also having a seminar about how to read and study the Bible to let it dig in because when we take a good look, it really comes to life instead of easy to poke fun of and poked out questions at from afar. Let me pray for you today. Would you bow your heads? Lord, we thank you that all of these eyewitness documents were recorded and saved. Lord, I can't imagine the sacrifice over the millenniums of people, what they had to do to protect the Bible, to keep it all together, to keep it accurate. Lord, we know that you had a hand on it. Lord, it is amazing that these words are not just something that I read, Lord, but it actually in the end reads me and leads me to discover who you are and your plan for our lives and for my life. Lord, I pray that we'll become curious again for those with doubts and questions. Lord, I pray that there'll be this wonder and awe that stir them to again read your word and to chew on it with other people in great dialogue. dialogue. Lord, I pray that you'll continually do as it's always done, it's done to me, Lord, that you will breathe life into these words and Lord, let it shape and affect my life, I pray. And everyone who reads it in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Thanks again for coming today. I'm so glad that you're a part of our church. On the way out, as Wayne has already mentioned, we're having a bit of a ministry fair because we're more than a Sunday experience. We really want you to become a community. You know, and so if we were a baseball team, let me promise you, it's way more fun to play the game than to watch it on the side. So we have lots of ministries. We'd love you to check them out and become part of the team. Be a part of our community here together as you grow in faith and encourage each other in faith. God bless. Have a great Sunday and we'll see you again next week.